I know the trick. If you want to speak longer, you, you go to the podium. <laughs> Uh, good afternoon, everybody, and it's really a privilege to be here with you. Uh, this morning, uh, a lady shook hand with me, and she said, uh, you are the boss of the three fantastic ladies, referring to the presentation you attended or you, you, you uh, uh, listened to yesterday from my three colleagues. So please give them a big hand, please. Uh, I'm here to uh, share with you uh, some experiences, one from the past and one from the present. Uh, it's really uh, a privilege, as I said, and I would like just to take you back when I was in your age, when I was young, when I was a student. Uh, I was in Cairo University in the first uh, part of the 60s, and one of our professors distributed to us a document, which is probably the most important global document until the present time. This is the Charter of the United Nations. And this professor later on became the sixth Secretary General of the United Nations, he's Dr. Botos Ghali, I'm sure you heard about him, and he's the one who lost his chance for another term because he uh, kept faith with the provisions of his mandate in this document. Now this document actually is important because it is, in, in some aspect, it is really uh, addressing your situation. Let's start by the preamble which says, we the people of the United Nations determined, and it said to save succeeding generations from the scourge of war. Succeeding generation, you, referring to you. And then it's about talking about uh, faith in fundamental human rights and establishing conditions under which uh, justice and respect uh, uh, prevails, and then to promote social progress and better standard of life. This is something that was done in the mid-40s, long time ago. Now, this standards of living and social ju justice was more elaborated in uh, chapter 9, in the same document where it's talk about uh, higher standard of living, uh, full employment, and all these you know, economic indicators which you hear from time to time. Unfortunately, chapter nine in this document was overtaken by chapter seven, which I'm sure most of us remember very well because it is the chapter that is actually elaborating on military interventions and economic sanctions. Anyway, this is uh, the first experience I wanted to share with you. Uh, at that time, just to be fair with the United Nations, at that time I think the main threat to the world was war, was global war, because you know the, the world was just emerging from two uh, severe wars, and so the, the main concern was war. Nowadays, I think we have uh, probably we can say, hopefully, that, that uh, the threat of uh, a global war is not with us, but there are, of course, these regional wars will stay with us. Now, the challenges facing the world, and this is where I take you to the present, the challenges which are facing the world are uh, many, but I may, be, can, I may summarize them in three, which, is, which are terrorism, poverty, and corruption. And they are all interrelated and correlated. As we are talking today, you heard to uh, one of our uh, delegates, uh, the gentleman from Malaysia, who was giving some numbers. I would like to add them, to add to them. Uh, he spoke about those people living in less than one dollar a day or two dollars a day. I can also speak about uh, countries which I visited in a mission as part of my work in Ofid. 
and they are living in, uh, in consuming. I, I visited countries in Africa where the consumption of clear water does not exceed uh, 20 liters. 20 liters is, uh, is 80 glasses of a standard glass which you have. This is for everything, for washing, for cooking, for drinking, etc. And this is compared to more than 300 liters, the world standard. Then we have, as we are talking now, we have 1.6 billion people deprived from electricity. And this is why we are now putting energy for the poor as one of our priorities. And we have also, as we are here now, we have 2.5 billion people uh, using biomass for their, for their fuel. And 1.5 million, according to WHO statistics, 1.5 million ladies and children dying because of this inhaling the smoke. And by the way, when you want to define poverty, please don't listen to economists. The per capita, the per capita, this is a myth, because per, per, per capita uh, income as a measurement of wealth is really is, a, is a, an arithmetic uh, equation, doesn't mean much to me, and I don't think it doesn't mean much to many, many even uh, 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 big economists like Stiglitz and others, because it's just, you know, dividing the value by the population and you assume that people are receiving the same income, which is not true. If you want to, uh, I, I see many, many uh, people from our countries, Arabs, and uh, I always would like to refer them to Tawfiq al-Hakim, an Egyptian playwright, in his uh, novel, uh, The Diary of, uh, uh, of an Attorney General in the Countryside. And by the way, it is translated to more than 40 languages, I believe. And one of the best translations is found in any library. Uh, this is uh, his experience when he was describing the, the, re, the, the countryside in Egypt and how poverty is pre prevailing. This is something. It's like when, I, uh, when we talk about what's happening in Egypt. I don't know, is, is Wael when I'm here? Wael, are you here? But he's not in the room. No, no, because I was also in, in London in a panel and it was somebody asking me how would you describe what's happening in Egypt. And I told him, if you like to know what's happening in Egypt, go and read, and read the Najim Mahfouz trilogy. Najim Mahfouz is also a Nobel uh, Prize winner. He's the one who described the growth of the, of the, of the middle, middle class and the aspiration, which actually showed in, in at Tahrir Square. Anyway, let me go back to my subject, because I know that, that uh, using the podium doesn't give me you know, the absolute uh, right to, to, to speak. Uh, now, these three challenges which I enumerated, uh, terrorism, poverty, and corruptions, are uh, global. And you need, you need a global solution to, uh, to, uh, uh, to solve them, or to resolve them, or to act on them. And by the way, when you say uh, corruption, for example, people think that corruption is just belongs to one category of people, and sometimes they even do some labeling that this is him. Wolverson, the former director, uh, Wolf Wolverson, the former director of the World Bank, always describe it in a bitter way. He always says that, that uh, bribery, for example, which is a best manifestation of, of corruption, is an equation of two sides. There is the donor, there is the receiver. So it's always, you know, uh, uh, have this kind of, of definitions. Uh, we, we in OFID, my institution, 35 years ago, our, our countries decided to share their uh, resources with their fellow developing countries in more than 100 developing countries. And now we are completing 35 years of, in business. We uh, financed more than 3,000 transactions or operations across the globe. We go everywhere, regardless of religion or region or ideology or whatever. And we have a success story that we would like to share with you. We are uh, happy with what we are doing, and the reason is that we are not politicized. We have no conditions. Uh, we, do not, we do not impose the project on the recipient. We do it. 
and we take also uh, initiatives like capacity buildings and energy for the poor. And uh, sometimes uh, when we talk about social responsibilities, I did not really dwell on that subject because actually it's the core business of my institution. It's not something that we are adding or we are doing it as a supplemental to what we are doing. It is the core business of OFI social responsibilities because we are uh, doing it to help our uh, fellow developing countries in different parts of the world. And uh, the difference, uh, we are doing a lot of business with corporations. Uh, recently, we, we did uh, a grant uh, uh, with the Shell Foundation in, in Kenya, Tanzania, and Nigeria, and we are actually planning to do more. But the difference between us and the corporations is that, you know, uh, when we have uh, the financial crisis, which is uh, actually crippling the world nowadays, and one of the uh, partners, one of the recipients of our uh, assistance uh, has the, their, their, uh, their rating dropped from B to triple C's. In that month or that uh, two weeks, actually, we signed two agreements with them. In other words, we stand by our partners when they have a problem rather than to back away from them. And this is the, the difference. You heard about the Millennium Development Goals, the eight. And you heard my people, my colleague telling you that there is a missing uh, missing goal, which is energy for the poor, eradication of energy poverty, and that's the one we took since uh, 2007. We increased our involvement from 19% over the years to 26%. From November 2007 until now, we financed 37 energy projects in 24 developing countries, and we are doing more. Anyway, the, 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 the one that is uh, the, the goal, the eighth goal, that I think is a part of your responsibilities is the, is the partnership uh, where you can influence um, uh, your, uh, your government, politicians, whatever, because this is how you know, we can work together and, and do it. And uh, uh, I will conclude by uh, giving just an advice. I was talking to Wael. And I told him that, you know, I just read a book recently about uh, power. And uh, I told him there was an advice which I would like to pass for you. Uh, and this is, if you have a target, so uh, this is uh, whether it is uh, or anywhere, if you have a target and you reach that target, stop there. Don't try to exceed it. Otherwise, otherwise, this will backfire. Thank you very much.